Right. Um, yeah. So I'm here to tell you guys a bit more about Condaforge and the Mamba project, and especially the Lip Mamba project, which I hope is useful. Um, so just to give a bunch of quick introduction words about the Conda ecosystem, a lot of people know it historically for Python or data science, but it's not actually only that. Uh, it's a general purpose package management on top of like a different uh, host system, basically. And in the Conda ecosystem, like both Conda and Mamba, so Conda is the like older package manager and Mamba is a bit of a newer re-implementation. And they are both using a SAT solver for package resolution, but different ones. And in the Conda, the Conda ecosystem is completely cross-platform, so it works with Windows, Mac, and Linux, and it's also language agnostic, so it's not Python specific. Uh, there are binary packages, and it's also build system agnostic, so you can use CMake, uh, auto tools, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so basically, the tagline here is Linux style packaging for everyone, so that people on Windows and Mac can also enjoy the same kind of nice package managers that we have as APT or DNF. And now Mamba is, as I briefly mentioned, a fast Conda compatible package manager. So it works with all the Conda packages out there. Um, specifically, Conda Forge or BioConda are two very large channels that are very well supported and ship a lot of bleeding edge scientific software. Uh, it works on Linux, Mac OS, and Windows, as I already said, and it's implemented in C++ for speed. And it natively supports virtual environments and licensed under BSD3. Uh, I'm also part of the Conda Forge project, and I want to speak about that a bit as well, because I think it's in the interest of this conference. So Conda Forge is the largest channel for Conda packages by number of packages. It's a public collection of recipes. Uh, recipes are like the build scripts and metadata for packages uh, on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Uh, and then on Mac OS, we have for the M1 and the old x64. And Linux, we have packages for Arch64, x64, and um, uh, PPC 64 LE. Uh, there are over 3,300 individual contributors and 25 steering committee members, so it's a very large project. Uh, and there are over uh, like around 15,000 libraries that we are shipping in many different versions, which totals 700,000 something packages, a bit over 3.6 terabytes, and over 300 million monthly downloads. And one cool thing is that it's uh, almost entirely run on public infrastructure. So we are using GitHub and Azure to a crazy extent. And another thing is that artifacts are never deleted, which gives us reproducibility. So you can recreate the same environment in 10 years with the same packages, and hopefully it will still work. Uh, this is a chart of the growth of Conaforge. So here in blue, you see the Conaforge channel in download count. Uh, it's really like kind of an exponential growth here. And we've recently overtaken the defaults channel on from Anaconda. And there's also Bioconda, which is also growing quite a lot. So that's really cool because those are two really successful open source projects. And I want to kind of put Conaforge somewhere between a Linux distro and PyPI. So with a Linux distro, I would say you have usually solid and established packaging. You have a few members that are basically quality control and gatekeeping a bit, which makes it slower to update. But usually the quality, let's say, is it's pretty good. Uh, on, on the opposite side, you have PyPI or NPM, where there are basically no real quality checks because everybody can just upload their own packages and publish them. And yeah, you have a member per package. Uh, in Conaforge, we have Conaforge Core, which can and does do some quality checks. Uh, we, but we also have really a lot of members, and they have independent feedstocks. A feedstock is a Git repository where they can just like change the recipe, and once they merge a pull request, which they can do independently, the package will be published to the channel. So it's more free in that sense. So how Conaforge operates, we have a staged recipe repository where we check the initial recipe quality and make sure that it's actually building. And then once the recipe is merged, a feedstock, which is a Git repository on GitHub, is created, and then we run automatic builds on public CI for all the different platforms that we support. 
and that are supported by the recipe. The maintainer controls the release schedule for this library. Uh, we have an admin bot and other bots for general feedstock maintenance tasks. And we also have automated version bumps from the bot. They are automatically detected. GitHub, PyPI, and URL schemes are checked. We have automated migrations uh, because Conor Falls is a rolling distribution. So if one library like OpenSSL changes, then all the packages that depend on OpenSSL will be automatically rebuilt. And we have help via GitHub issues and the GitHub chat. Uh, example software on Conor Falls, all kinds of stuff, C, C++, Python, R, Julia, Qda Toolkit, OpenCV, GCC, HDF5, everything you can imagine. And we actually want everything. So um, what is a recipe? A recipe is mostly static YAML with some ginger uh, and a build script that's usually bash or CMD on Windows. Uh, it supports cross compilation with like build host and run environments uh, for where the host environment can be of a different target platform. Um, and dependencies can be easily constrained. And so Conaforge is kind of a huge repository of mostly static information about all sorts of packages and also older versions as in a way it's kind of a Wikipedia style knowledge base of all software. And I hope we can go further in that direction. So this is what the recipe looks like. So you have a source section here, which gives you UL and char for the source code, uh, version and package name, uh, some build number and then the requirements. And here they're not really constrained, but usually you would pro probably see some constraints. Uh, how do virtual environments work with Conda or Mamba? So they work just like a regular normal Unix style prefix. So you have these kind of standard folders over here. And then files are mostly hard linked from a shared package cache in a packages folder. So that means that if you have multiple virtual environments, the files are actually shared. So you don't really uh, have copies of them. And then files are copied if the prefix needs to be replaced, which sometimes happens. And that's how we make packages relocatable. Now I want to talk a bit about Mamba and the parts and how they can be reused. Um, so we're using libarchive for extracting packages, libcurl for downloading data, libsol for solving the dependencies, OpenSSL for cryptographic verification. And then some other libraries um, and Loma and JSON, YAML CPP and speedlog for logging. Uh, we also support bootstrapping with a, another tool called Micromamba. Micromamba is completely statically linked has zero external dependencies and uses the host SSL certificates. Compressed to TarBZ2, it's roughly five megabytes. Extracted is around 12 megabytes on Linux, a bit less on Windows and Mac because there we use more of the host SDK libraries. It it's almost has feature parity with Mamba and you don't need to be a root uh, on the computer that you're using it to install new packages, which is a pretty nice feature. Um, I want to talk about package formats because I think that's, for example, the lesson that was learned by the Conda ecosystem. So the old default is tar busy too, but it's slow to extract and also slow to index on the servers. The new format is .conda, which hasn't really like gotten everywhere yet, but hopefully we can work on that in the future. And the benefits are that it uses ZSD for inner compression. So you have two uh, folders actually that are compressed inside. One contains the metadata and one contains the content of the package. And it uses an uncompressed zip as outer layer. So the metadata is split off to make it faster for indexing. A tool that I'm currently working on that I'm excited to share is called currently working title is Power Loader for fast down and upload. It's very much inspired by another library that was Linux only that's called librepo, which is used in DNF. It features things like parallel downloads, mirrors and automatic mirror selection, retries and fallbacks to other mirrors, automatic checksum validation, resumable downloads, and zchunk and delta transfers so that you only download the new uh, parts of a file. And it supports um, HTTP, FTP, OCAI registries, and S3 mirrors, which I'm pretty excited about because basically, all these uh, GitLab, GitHub, they all have OCI registries. And it also supports uploading to HTTP, S3, and OCI. We still need to work on it. It's kind of in an alpha state right now. We're also using Libsolve, which is a really cool library for fast uh, SAT solving. 
Uh, it's uh, quite a good speed improvement over the Conda solver. And it's a pretty efficient backtracking solver. And we uh, make use of it also for variant packages. And we can prefer give, uh, certain variants. And it's almost 100% compatible with the legacy kind of Conda solver. And actually, the solver that Mamba uses is currently being integrated back into Conda and will hopefully ship with an experimental flag soon. Uh, lib Mamba is Mamba without the comment line interface. It has C and C++ bindings, so you can easily reuse it. And it can actually be used to create language-specific package managers. So we've written one that's called Ramba, and which is a package manager for or in R, actually, that works similar to the R native package manager. And then we also have libmamba.py, which we are currently in the process of splitting off, which is the Python bindings to libmamba. <clears throat> I also briefly want to say like a bit more about package signing, which is something we are like we've implemented in this year and it was a lot of work. So package signing is using OpenSSL for like key ver uh, signature verification, and it's based on the update framework and the Conda Content Trust uh, work. And uh, we basically put signatures in the, to the repo data JSON. And it's uh, modeled after the tough the update framework. So we have like stuff like a root role, key manager role, and package manager role. And the process to sign is something we are currently working or thinking about a lot. So one option is to sign with an online key that's on the server. That's very easy. But we would also like to figure out ways to sign with an off offline key. So give the package maintainer um, uh, the artifact. Uh, unsigned, and then the package manager can sign it with his key. Or we can also figure out if we can produce signatures beforehand. And then um, the package man maintainer uploads the signature, and then it gets built in the CI services. But that's pretty difficult because then the package maintainer has a lot of work, and it's only really possible if we support reproducible bits. Here you can kind of see how this is working. So Quetz is the package server that we are working on. And that has um, signature data that delivers signature data in the repo data JSON, and also has tough roles that can delegate further down. So you have an entire security chain with a root role and like multi multiple other delegations. There's a blog post coming out about packet signing pretty soon. We are also looking into six store and other initiatives that are really well funded, and we're trying to figure out if uh, if there are ways how we can reuse this for signing these conda packages. I think that would be great because uh, setting all this infrastructure up and so is a, is a huge uh, task. And if we could share that with another community, that would be pretty great. And we'd also like to figure out better how we can do identity management. And we'd really like to leverage GitHub because conda Forge is already operating on GitHub a lot. So one idea that I also wanted to present and uh, that I hope I can, we can solve at some point with like libmamba and these initiatives is that uh, we have a bunch of uh, applications like FreeCAD, QGIS, Blender that use, for example, Python as an extension language or a plugin language, but they don't, like they have kind of home ground solutions on how to do plugin management. And it works kind of like sometimes with calling into pip or installing a zip file from somewhere or something like this. But they all have, uh, like, there are some limitations. And uh, can, it's kind of my belief that if we could give them libmamba, they could have their own package repository or reuse one that already exists and then have an easy way to uh, manage plugins that work with the, uh, with the um, underlying application. And that also, like, can ship native code, can ship code with from many different programming languages all natively. Uh, and uh, also have, for example, in the interdependencies and stuff like this. So I think that would be really cool. And uh, there was also really quite strong interest, at least from the FreeCAD and Q QGIS communities to go into that direction. So I hope we can explore that further soon. I just want to quickly talk about other pieces in the Mamba org. So I already briefly mentioned Quetz, which is an open source, easy to deploy package server. And so, uh, code is based on fast API, a Python library. It's storage agnostic. So you can use S3, Azure, 
Google Cloud Storage and hopefully soon OCI as well to push the packages to. Uh, we have pluggable authentication. You can uh, and a bunch of implementations already. Um, fast searching for packages and it's really extensible with plugins, both in the front and the back end, um, which is pretty cool. And then we are also working on a tool called Boa, which is a build tool for Conda packages that comes with an improved recipe format, which is like more pure YAML and doesn't have Jinja because Jinja makes YAML not really parsable anymore. Uh, we are also trying to improve cross compilation further and um, enable WASM support. So compiling all the Conda Forge packages to WASM would be really cool. Uh, and we have an experimental interactive mode or REPL where you can kind of debug uh, um, the package build, which was a bit inspired by binary builder JL, which I find pretty cool. And for next year, we're, uh, we're also trying to have more reproducible packages and figure out stuff like deleting timestamps before we um, archive the, pack the files and stuff. Uh, in 2021, uh, we got some funding from the CCI grant that we won. And one thing that we really want to do is improve solver messaging further. So Libsolve already has pretty nice sol uh, solver error messages. But we want to really look at the PubGrab projects. And I'm really keen to see the PubGrab talk um, and see if that improves solver messages. And uh, we want to see how in how far we can use that or implement that into Libsolve. Uh, we'd, we'd also like to look at how we can further sandbox virtual environments because currently um, like containers are nice because they're more sandboxed from the host system. Virtual environments are also nice. Um, but maybe there's a way to create kind of ad hoc containers uh, for these virtual environments. And I know that Windows and uh, Mac OS have uh, pretty good uh, sandboxes and Linux and Flatpak also has them. And we want to parallelize everything more, make it faster. And we also want to improve the server story, um, store source code for all the recipes out there and make builds more reproducible. <clears throat> and then finally roll out the package and repo data signing to Conaforge because right now we have the implementation in Mamba, but it's not rolled out anywhere. And that's it, thanks. And uh, if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to take them. The chat. There were a few. So um, one of mine was: To what extent is kind of Forge more or less like a Wikipedia of all software than, say, Nix Geeks, Debian, Spac, or any other package ecosystem? So one thing that I've seen in other packaging is ecosystems is that um, the metadata might not be so machine readable or parsable or like not so static. Mm -hmm. What I really think we should be doing is have some part of the metadata as static as possible. And um, yeah, I think YAML, for example, is a good format for that because um, it's not a programming language, which I've seen in some other, uh, like some metadata, use, uh, some package managers use, for example, Python for this data. And I don't think that's the appropriate choice. OK. All right, next question. Are .conda files going to be the default on Conda Forge at some point? I have yet to see one in the wild, but maybe I'm just oblivious. So they are actually already shipped on the Anaconda channels, but not on Conda Forge, that's right. One reason for that is uh, backwards compatibility, I think, or um, <clears throat> it would also take uh, quite a bit of energy in terms of CPU cycles to convert all of them. But yeah, like uh, I would love to tackle this soon because they are actually great and a major improvement. OK. Um, what's better about Rumba versus the R native package manager? Probably nothing, but it was a cool experiment. <laughs> ah, okay. um, and I'm... like, if you want to interact with Python packages or C++ packages, you know, uh, you probably don't get that from the R native package manager. I, OK, so that's a good, so, I mean, is the, is the idea that it allows you know more, more easy interaction with native package managers? Is, and it obviously is doing solving. Is the solving better than the R native package manager? To be honest, I don't properly know how the R native package manager solves dependencies. Ah, okay. But um, like 
if you have a C++ dependency, for example, I maybe our native package manager on Linux would install you like boost or something from APT. But how does it do that on Windows, you know? Mm -hmm. So if, if your R package needs boost, and, and one other thing that's actually an improvement is I think the R packages are usually not compiled, at least back in the days. And so usually they are compiled and we actually ship binaries. So you have a binary package manager, which is much faster than, um, you know, using the CRAN packages and have to compile them locally. Okay, there was another question that I think partially got answered in the chat, but I'm gonna do it live too. <laughs> I saw that kind of package support was integrated into LibSolve at some point. Is LibSolve extensible enough that you could use it for Mamba before Conda support was upstreamed? I think what that means is that, so I, I thought the extension to LibSolve was like to support the Conda package format. Isn't that <clears throat> so Lib, right? LibSolve kind of, LibSolve themselves, the, uh, like the author of LibSolve actually wrote the initial, uh, like the, the initial support for Conda metadata format. Um, and um, yeah, libsolv is extensible to some extent, yeah, but um, I'm not sure if I like the second part of the question. I mean, um, so I think what Conda he's asking is, is like, could you just take libsolv and use it for Conda without whatever contribution was made to the library? Is it general enough for that? Or do um, you have to have yeah, an adapter? Yeah, you could, uh, like you can actually read like the Repolator JSON file directly with libsolv and then do stuff with mm -hmm. libsolv if you want. Uh, okay. I think it's better to use libmamba because we ship all the wrappers and like the nice teeth around it, but. Right. Okay, and um how to handle the growing number of PRs in Conda Forge staged recipes. Yeah, that's that's a tough question. I think we could, exp like everybody can apply to become a staged recipes maintainer or a core maintainer. And then there is a vote. And if the existing core team trusts that person, then yeah. And we'd love to onboard more people to do these roles in the community. So I don't know how it works for Conda Forge, but like for, for SPAC, I mean, we have a single recipe per package and everyone yep. sort of contributes to it. So the PRs, um, we, we did have a problem that maintainers weren't getting notified about changes to the packages. And so we made a bot that that basically pings them. Is that something yeah. that ContaForge does? Uh, no, in ContaForge you get a completely independent feedstock, which is a completely yeah. independent GitHub repository. And if, so if I make a PR to stage recipes, uh, like the maintainers of stage recipes or the core uh, maintainers, look at it and if it's good, they merge it. And once it merged, there's an automatic process to create a new fresh Git repository where you will be added as a maintainer and you have full right, like you can do anything. <clears throat> all right. Um, and I think that's all the questions for now. Um, I guess I, I can ask another question since we have yeah. like two more minutes. Um, <sighs> You know I can ask questions all day. Um, the so for for libsolve, you said you're looking at sort of modifying the error messages. How I, I haven't dug into libsolve enough to to look at the API. How extensible is it? How much control do you have over the solver? Like, is it easy to add like a new feature to libsolve if you wanted to add a new you know I don't know support for features, support for optional dependencies, support for something to it? What's the how how easy is it to modify? Um, it's it's pretty tough C code, like libsolve mm -hmm. itself. Uh, so it's not straightforward to modify the solver as such, I would say. I think um, like you can do some cool tricks, I think with like how you structure your packages and dependencies and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for uh, there are definitely areas that we also need to explore in the libsolve code base. And it's like kind of a research and development project to figure out how we can uh, get better error messages out of libsolve. But I think it basically like for all it does, like it will record like what packages had incompatibilities. And I'd, look to, I'd like to look at this record of incompatibilities that libsolve finds and see if we can somehow um, like use all the information that's there to actually get or uh, to better error messages, but I cannot yet say how and if it's going to work. And we'll definitely try to use PubGrab RS uh, and to make it read Conda repo data, and we'll see how well that works and what kind of error messages we get out of that. 
Okay, I have a long question to that effect also, which is sometimes this, this is like, it doesn't fit in one thing, but it's sometimes when solving large environments, there can be a single old <laughs> package that forces the whole environment in some direction, like to use an older version of Python. Are you planning on including solver warnings and logs that would let the user know why certain solve decisions are done? Um, we do have an open issue to that effect. And I would love to figure something out, but it's kind of, it's hard to uh, figure out the user's intent basically sometimes. So yeah, like some warnings I think would be appropriate for certain circumstances, yeah. And do you think that that's straightforward? I mean, like how, how easy is it to understand the chain of reasons for an unsat case in LibSolve? I mean, for example, uh, in this case, you know, if you don't specify the version of Python that you want, uh, but you get like an older version as, as the latest Python that exists. Uh, like we can just check what's the latest version of Python and then tell you, okay, for some reason you only got Python 3.6, but actually Python 3.9 is already available. Maybe you can uh, figure out. And then, I mean, we could also probably show like what package is constraining that. And we do have like kind of implementations for doing like, um, we copied that from DNF, which is like a repo query command. Maybe we can show all the reverse dependencies or the dependencies of given packages and this kind of stuff. Okay, I have one last question and then we'll go to the break and resume it's, it's uh, 20 after. If your talk was too short, so you have time <laughs> for all these questions. Um, so the SAT community and SMT and all the related areas, they have benchmark competitions where they look at solver speed. And I'm kind of thinking that it might be time for us to have something like that for package managers. What do you think of that idea? Do we have enough Bring example cases? Yeah, yeah, we should. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, I, I have to say like, I'm not the major contributor to Libsol for sure. So like, I'm not even contributing a lot. Like most of the code was uh, written by um, Michael Schröder. Yeah. So, are you looking for someone to take on the mantle of that LibSolve guy for 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 package managers that are not? I mean, it would be uh, it would be <laughs> awesome to find uh, more people to actually hack on LibSolve. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, cool. 